Marshall from Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Happy Tuesday. Sagar and I have a great episode today. We are speaking with Zach Grauman. He was Andrew Yang's campaign manager during the 2020 campaign and now co-hosts the podcast Forward with Andrew. His book is out it's called Long Shot, How Political Nobodies Took Andrew Yang National and the New Playbook That Let Us Build a Movement. Lots of great stuff here. We're really interested in this idea of there being a new playbook, given all the different dynamics of campaigns, especially post-2016. So lots of really great stuff here. Lots of good back and forth. We'd love to hear what you all think about the show. So leave us a comment, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. Hope you enjoy this episode. Zach Grauman, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to see you both. Absolutely, man. All right. So we're here to talk a little bit about your book and we're going to get to that. But one of the things I want to get your immediate reaction to is you and I and Marshall are taping this right after the Pennsylvania election results and just a general midterm reaction. So I'm curious, where's your head at in terms of reaction to the results that we know so far? And uh, what does the current environment tell you about where things are headed? I would say this is it's not a you know, someone who follows it as closely as you guys do. But I'd say this, the, the main press line you're seeing is maybe Trump's not as powerful as we think he is, right? With uh, some of the candidates he's endorsed, not cleaning house. Um, but I would say, uh, I mean, look, the main takeaway I have to this whole thing is that Democrats need to find a message, need to find it fast. Um, I don't think Roe v. Wade is enough, Um so, but they've been scram- scrambling for anything that gets people to care. Um, Republicans have found wedge issues over and over, and they've and you've seen it since um, you know Virginia kind of uh, since the Virginia race last year, I guess it was. But um, you haven't the Dems. The Dems have like theoretically the best you know like intentions and can't have Manila get their ducks in a row. So I think you're seeing it. You saw it last night. You're going to keep seeing it. So nothing really surprising. I thought Oz would pull it out. It looks like he might. Um, it's still I think it's too close to call when I checked this morning. So yeah, maybe. that's right. So here's my real question, and I'm yeah. this relates to the topic of the book and a new playbook and everything like that. Andrew Yang, your candidate, obviously innovated with the lack of a tie when it came to his presentation. John Fetterman, the Democratic nominee in Pennsylvania, has taken that innovation to its logical conclusion, which is why even wear a button-up shirt and a suit? Why not just wear shorts and a hoodie, even if you're meeting with President Biden? What is your take on this casualization phenomenon. Cause like my quick thing here, I saw a tweet from someone, they said like the clear takeaway from this is that we're gonna see a lot more members and candidates dressing casually. And my word of caution is that I think in Andrew's case and in John's case, the casualness is authentic. Yes. And I think very clearly we're gonna see a lot of very inauthentic. Oh, I'm chill. I'm, I'm casual. Cool. Yeah, fellow, I'm fellow cool. Kids. I'm with it. So how, how would you advise people think about dress and presentation in this moment? Literally last night, uh, my buddy uh, sent me a, a screenshot of John Fetterman wearing uh, gym shorts. And um, like, you, like we first said, we started with no tie. Andrew Yang wore no tie, so Fetterman could not wear pants. Um, it's kind of like the mentality. But it's so here's what I'd say. And this is what I wrote in the books, like, the game has changed, particularly on bigger races, like really local races, different because it's so entrenched with the, the voters haven't moved. Right. But the national races, the ones that get a lot of attention, they start to compete in the attention economy where. If you're Andrew Yang, you're John Fetterman, you're uh, you're Liz Warren, whoever you are, you're not just competing against your fellow candidates. You are, of course, but you're also competing against everything else. Kim Kardashian. Taylor Swift, HBO's new hit series, your friends' text messages. You go down the list and because all day long, we're just bombarded. So completely agree with you. You're going to start, people are catching on in some ways, but what I want to, what I talk about in the book is how to like understand that and own it. And to your point, it's absolutely about authenticity because particularly younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, they can smell the BS right out the gate. Um, and people in general, like, especially if it's, if they're hit over the head over and over. So if you're bucking the trend by not wearing a tie or not uh, not wearing pants or wearing gym shorts or hoodie, whatever it is, to be 
because you think you're supposed to, they'll sniff it. Right. But if you can tie it to your message or who you are, like, yeah, I don't wear a tie. I wear a t-shirt because I'm an entrepreneur. I work from home or I'm a stay at home dad or whatever your lane is uh, going to be substantially better. People do. You can't misconstrue the lack of a tie or breaking trend with not taking the job seriously, which is a really hard balance, especially if the race, if the race is longer. Right. Um, and we I talk about that in the book too. Like it's harder to balance the new and outsider breaking through and trying to get some establishment traditional voters behind you too. Real quick follow-up. Can you clarify your point about local races versus national races? Because for example, I'm thinking of the San Francisco DA's race. Mm. Um, Jason Boudin, right? Obviously, that is a local race, you know, c- prosecutions, being a lawyer of that type, like that's the definition of something local, but we're going to cover it on the realignment. We're going to cover it on breaking points because mm-hmm. clearly that's a, that's a story. Well, how are these progressive DAs going to really handle the post-2020 crime wave and debates about California and all these different bits. So what actually is like a local race versus a national race? Ooh. So I, I think there's a difference to what you call national coverage and then who actually votes, right? So, and, and so give me, I think a lot of people paid somewhat, paid more attention to this past New York City mayor's race. Um, both you had Andrew in it, you had crime going up, you had a black cop in the race, uh, there at Adams with a really compelling story. You um, like that race got a lot of national attention, but voting was like a little up, but it's like nine to 11 percent of New York City votes in that race. It's a tiny sliver. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. You could already a lot of voter suppression type stuff or like you have to re- if you want to switch parties, you have to register in February after a, a national election to do that. And then you're voting in June, like no one's paying attention. Like everybody hated Bill de Blasio, but very almost any, nobody voted for him or against him. Um, this is how New York city politics work. So um, what I'd say is like, look, so you guys, and there's various outlets that will cover like Dr. Oz's race. They're covering that you're covering JD, um, JD Vance. You're covering some of these races, but in the state, is that affecting turnout? Right. It mm-hmm. depends. Um, like the Georgia runoff, that affected turnoff like crazy um, because there was so much money and attention put on it. Sometimes there's hype, but it's not really driving a lot of different voter behavior. Um, and then the biggest difference mechanically is like presidential national races, people I, tend to self-identify with or have a personal connection to. Everybody feels connected to the president um, in some way. In the mayor's race, which I wasn't really on, but it was different. Like you had but I'll give you an example. Like the, the traditional gatekeepers have much more pull. Like mm-hmm. uh, Catherine Garcia, I'll give you an example. Like Catherine Garcia, this is probably not particularly nice to her, but I'm just going to say it. So the, she, she comes in, she was the sanitation, head of sanitation in New York City, which if you ask New Yorkers both on the street, anecdotally and in polling, their number two issue after crime was the trash. Everybody hated the New York City's filthy. Yeah. And she was in charge of the trash under Bill de Blasio. Like she should be, and she wasn't favor. This is like not the person you want running the city theoretically. Um, and she's not a particularly good debater, compelling personality. Like you're not seeing anything special there. And her numbers reflected that the entire race. She was polling at one to 3%. She wasn't raising any mo- money, nothing. That said, three to four weeks out from the race, New York Times endorses her. She finishes at 24% and goes into essentially second place. And so that doesn't happen in national politics. That doesn't happen in some of these bigger races, but some of these where the local voter blocks like go with uh, an outlet or two, that's a big deal. So that's uh, the biggest difference I saw. Sagar, sorry for, for hogging. I just want to make this point super clear. To your point in 2020, the New York Times endorses, wasn't it Elizabeth Warren and um, Amy Klobuchar? And Amy, yeah. 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 That did not matter at all, like literally did not matter, but in your, in the local context, it obviously did. Yeah. So, yeah. This is why I want to emphasize this though, is that something that Crystal and I focus on a lot on our show is we're like, Hey guys, like legacy media is still really, really powerful. We're like, mm-hmm. you know, we love the internet. I'm a product of the internet. I owe my <laughs> career to the internet. All of this is on the internet. That being said, it's also not even what 120th is powerful in terms of affecting national outcome. And yes. that's kind of something I want to derive and drive into with you, which is that to me, Andrew was maybe the first candidate of the internet, 
possibly the second if you are willing to consider Ron Paul 2008, which was much more of a yeah. nascent like message board phenomena. So what did you learn about the power of the internet and the limitations of the internet during the Yang oh, campaign? Oh, man. It, I mean, you nailed it on the head. Like it's, yeah. I actually wrote one of the chapters I wrote in books, like what got you here won't get you there. Oh. And so you got to think, we've got this candidate who is completely unknown. You have a team that's completely inexperienced, right? Um, so the traditional playbook wasn't going to work for us. Now, what's the traditional playbook, right? You get uh, your mainstream endorsers, right? Yep. Uh, you've got, uh, so that's like your surrogates and other elected officials that really, frankly, want a job in the administration or you to help them down the road. So they'll go on uh, XYZ media outlet to talk about you. Mainstream media. That's the, C- I mean, who's that? CNN, MSNBC, Fox. And then you can say the Times, the Post. And I guess you can say the Journal, although they've been a little bit, uh, they buck the trend against uh, the big ones sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got your high dollar donors, uh, which is in the Democratic Party, it's like, 70,000 folks that give the max every year. It's not a huge number in the bundlers with them that wrangle these donors. Um, and then the large campaign apparatuses and political consultants, like these are the folks that really drive um, what, what we call like the front runners, right? Who are yeah. the, the favorites? Um, we had, we couldn't get any of those, right? Um, so we had to go our own route. We had to go alternative press and podcasts and social media and folks like you. We had to go to celebrities and influencers and folks that had a big following, but not necessarily anything political. You know, you saw Chappelle and Mm -hmm. Elon Musk and others come endorse Andrew. You had, we went small dollar donors, right? Which is digital operation and uh, grassroots fundraisers and uh, online funding. And then a nimble campaign apparatus where we had, we're an entrepreneur. We were, you know, scrappy and young and uh, hiring people without experience, but a lot of passion, right? Um, so there's the pros and cons, right? So we had to compete in the attention economy and stand out. Um, and that's what got us through the bigger, that's what got us to beat the Jill and brands and the, the kind of your Cory uh, Booker. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the run of the mill, uh, great politician, if you will. I mean, it depends how you define politician and great, but you know, they're, they are good at theoretically what they're supposed to do, but they weren't really standing out in the broader field. So we got through there and got people pay attention to us and our message um, and use the internet to raise money and awareness and engagement and all that stuff. Um, but then to get the next level, you really need that, those traditional players I'm talking about to somewhat line up behind you. And uh, we were never, I mean, frankly, what we had to do, whether it's the Cupid shuffle or giving money away in the debate stage or being kind of an internet type candidate or cutting against the grain, um, that stuff like kind of prevented us from taking the, the kind of the serious, get the establishment behind you. But the other thing is like that establishment and the left and the right is different, right? Like if you're like, I would argue that the Republican establishment is much more willing. They were I mean, clearly much more willing to line up behind Donald Trump than you would have seen the Democrats ever want to line up behind an Andrew Yang. Now mm. the, the obviously different types of candidates, but a similar, um, uh, some similarities, right, in terms of its lane and its outsider play. You know, it's interesting because I'd love to talk more about the endorsement math because mm. this, uh, you know, uh, tweet is going around. People could find it where. So John Fetterman, he ran against Connor Lamb, who's a centrist member of Congress. And they have this list where Connor Lamb got all of the endorsements. Just it's like huge endorsements everyone, this, 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 or that. And then John Fetterman barely got any actual endorsements, yet he ran, ran away with it. So someone can, and once again, I think this is what's helpful about your framing here is that you're like, hey, like, there's some obvious like new conventional wisdom forming. Who cares about these big gatekeeping people? But as you know, South Carolina, what saves Joe Biden? Jim Clyburn endorsing him with black voters. So you can just look at that john fetterman thing and say hey i'm an insurgent i'm different who cares about these stodgy old people but there's this very clear distinction though so can you just talk about this dynamic and how insurgent or just any new playbook candidates let's call it that should think about balancing those those bits yeah so you want like the the young outsider disruptor person looks at this like endorsements don't matter you don't need them right i'm seeing this tweet like i'm I'm literally seeing smart people tweet this out 
And then you look, but you look at Joe Biden and Clyburn, like it changed everything. Right. So um, uh, here's what I'd say. What Andrew did well and what the best candidates do well in today's attention economy is they don't do the traditional brand identity, the traditional politician brand identity, which is your logo and your I'm a politician. I'm a Democrat. I, I do all the right things. I check my boxes, that sort of thing. What they do is not brand identity. It's identity branding where and it sounds it's stupid, you know, just flipping it. But basically, you're talking about like creating the ability for your supporters to identify with you and feel that personal connection. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But the big one I talk about is having this like us feeling where you say, like, if you're uh, like us, you're if you're Andrew, I'm an outsider, I'm a, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a big thinker, I'm fusioner. But you're like, and that's your persona all the time. And you are authentic to that throughout. And you find your tribe and you let folks in. And you could argue, and Joe Biden's actually a decent case study. They did a pretty good job branding him in that race. But my point is, if the endorsement is authentic to you, then it can be helpful. But in other worlds, it's just expected and no one cares, right? So if you're the traditional boring politician, you can get all the endorsements in the world. No one cares. It might help you with some of your traditional fundraisers um, because they can come raise, they share the list with you, they share their donor piece, whatever. Um, not a big deal. But uh, if Andrew, and we were not able to, the field is too crowded, but if Andrew was able to get one or two like major endorsements in that 2020 race, I would argue it would have been a pretty big deal because no one would have expected that and would have said, hey, this outsider is actually ruffling feathers, right? As opposed to, um, you know, Amy Klobuchar racking up or Booker racking up another endorsement too. Now, in the Joe Biden case in that instance, he was restore the soul of the nation. Barack Obama's on the nostalgic lane, right? I'm bringing back the good old days. And so for him to say, I'm going to win this because I'm going to like win the black vote, Jim Clyburn was authentic on brand at the right time, at the right state. And that's why it like kind of tilted the, the scale for him. But he got a dozens, probably hundreds of other endorsements on the way to South Carolina and they probably did nothing for him. So it's that type of authenticity, allowing people to identify with the candidate, um, Biden's different. That's like, you know, obviously a different time of the race, but that's kind of my general sense of it. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I really think is important here, which is that traditional endorsements don't matter, but the establishment infrastructure does matter. And that's kind of the interesting part with Fetterman, right? Which is that say what you will, Fetterman did not come out of nowhere. He was a statewide elected official with a massive high brand recognition and had been on television for basically two years straight. During the Stop the Steal stuff, for example, you know, he was constantly on CNN and on MSNBC challenging like the Texas attorney general being like, hey, you know, if you find any fraud, like I'll pay you. And anyway, uh, I actually at the time thought it was a very savvy strategy because I was like him leaning into that is speaking directly to those primary voters. What yep. did you learn during the campaign about the primary voter versus the average citizen? Because this is something that you focus on a lot and I focus on. A ton, yes. which is that on the metrics, the internet and its ability to mobilize people has been dramatically successful in almost every other arena except politics. The yes. internet, draw, look at uh, Joe Rogan, Andrew Schultz, guys who are selling out arenas, thousands of seats, mobilizing people to come to them purely off YouTube. But yes. why does that not translate to? coming to the ballot box to vote. I, I have yet to figure this question out. This is the key you just hit right there, yeah. is that, and we learned this the hard way, there is a difference between the internet and people who vote. <laughs> and uh, that's the, I love young people. I love the Yang gang. I love TikTok and all I think You don't vote. And it's uh, like, that's the game. And um, Andrew, yeah, I, I, I couldn't really find this. Um, and I didn't, it would take a long time to research, but I'm pretty sure Andrew's the first candidate to win the most likely to want to have a beer with. Like, you're the candidate I want to have a beer with and not win the Iowa or place top two in the Iowa caucus. Wow. Um, and, he's, and the other one was the youth vote. He's the first one, at least in the past four or five elections, where he wins the youth vote and did not win or get second place in the Iowa caucus. And that's you're kind of this that what you're seeing is like the younger generation. Uh, hasn't registered to vote. Um, they don't particularly know how it is hard. I will say this, like if you're, 
Um, like I live in New York, it's awful. Like every time you change your address, it becomes an ordeal. Um, and yet if you're young in New York City, you have to change your address a lot because uh, either they jack the rent up on you or you're trying to upgrade your lifestyle because you're going from you know a small closet to a little bit of a bigger closet to like, like you know, uh, you're trying to move the out every, the, every the New York dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is the hardest part where you'd have, I mean, Andrew would rate higher on uh, whether it was when he went on cable news or if you put, if it, if a reporter did a piece on Andrew is the most engagement they had, they'd get a ton of followers, but that did not translate to votes. Yeah. And um, this is the challenge now here's, and this is what, this is where it's really hard. Um, so you look at the numbers. Republic, Republican and Democrats are different here in terms of their, when you look at the voters, obviously on policy, but in terms of behavior. So Republicans, like 25% of Republicans trust the media. So most Republicans do not trust the media. Um, but Democrats are opposite. 75% yeah. of Democrats trust, trust the media, right? So uh, if you're looking at that, if the internet is like anti-establishment, leading, skewing anti-establishment, like fuck the trends, blow up the system, like go the like non-mainstream route, Republicans have an inherent advantage because you can just give the middle finger to everything, um, which is the Trump, uh, in some ways, the Trump strategy. And you can actually get mainstream Republican support in that way, at least traditional Republican support. Democrats, not so much. If you're like, hey, the New York Times is awful. Uh, well, I care, apparently in New York City mayor's race, you're losing at least 23 percent of that vote. Right. Um, and it's probably more with fewer candidates. So it's very different. Fetterman. Uh, in order to do it, Pennsylvania, you probably have that kind of moderate left that's a little less trusting the system. And, um, that's one of the states Andrew talks about, like where there's been a massive loss of manufacturing jobs. Uh, a Democrat that's a little more middle finger to the world, anti-establishment, has a bigger lane, I think, than a bigger city. Um, but that this is the inherent challenge, man. Um, Republicans have a, a leg up there than Democrats, for sure. You because we've had Andrew on the podcast a couple of times, the two of you are so clear eyed about that reality on the democratic side. I just want to editorialize and say, thank you. Because like, for example, you know, I, I, I interpersonally like Nina Turner. I, I think, I think she yeah. means well, but like Nina Turner, why are you saying voting for the democratic party is like eating a shit, 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 shit sandwich. No, it's a bowl that, of shit. Marshall. What, bowl, what bowl was it? Shit. Bowl of shit. Bowl yeah. of shit. Oh, it's even oh, more graphic. Hard. I, I feel that like, I feel so even worse. Um, yeah. I was, I was being, I was being nice about it, but like that, <laughs> right. Once again, and I'm speaking to the progressives in our audience, and this is the reality of what politics is. You couldn't think that is true. But to your point, Zach, if most Democratic voters don't think that way, you can't talk that way. You could probably talk that way in the Republican Party. So Trump could say voting for Bush is like yes. that and people would love it. But you literally cannot do that in Democratic politics. So here's my, my actual question here. And this gets that you're, I, I think, bemoaning the complicated parts of the youth vote here. And once again, we have a lot of like Yang game people. And this is something they usually bring up a lot. The gap between their idealism and just like the fact that politics is just like hard knuckle bullshit. You see this when people are like, man, the establishment stole 2020 because they all like got on a phone call and lined up behind Joe Biden after South Carolina and they didn't let the voters yeah. decide. It's just like, dude, like that's that's the game, man. Like, And, and, and yes. that's that's always going to be the game, no matter whether there's Twitter, Joe Rogan. CNN plus falling apart. There, there's a dynamic, you know, Andrew Yang endorsed for, for a reason. So how do you, how do you help people balance the fact that they want to reform the system with the fact that like, no matter what you do, there still is, Hey, if you don't endorse me, X, Y, and Z will happen. I mean, oh man, it, it's, this is like the core challenge, particularly for the left, because you have you know, the majority of people, I, you could even argue a good chunk of Trump's voters think he's an asshole, right? They don't love mm -hmm. his rhetoric. They don't love all of his policies. They like the fact that he, he's not bought, right? Like, and he's going to like his version of the truth, right? He's like somewhat of a truth teller. Um, and I'd say somewhat because <laughs> he's, he's known to lie and kind of spin things. Uh, uh, but it's um, the left you know, while it feels like they're not lying, they're doing the same thing where they're, they're like, they're, there's, it's the hypocrisy the moral hypocrisy that really gets folks on, on the, when he's talking about the left. And it's, um, it's one of the reasons I think Andrew left the Democratic Party. He's like, um, 
like I pointed out a bunch of problems in this. And we, if you had lined up, not even saying behind me, but behind the concept of this, I think we could run away with a lot more elections and give a, actually an actual strong counterpunch to the, to the Donald. And the, the Dems have not been able to do it. Um, I would argue this, like, I think if one mainstream Democrat said, Elon Musk has a point. They don't even have to like fully endorse him. They would reap massive rewards because the average person's like, yeah, Elon is like trying to take us to Mars and as mainstream electric vehicles. Like this guy's not uh, the evil corporate tyrant you're like pinning him out to Elon be. Elon has right? a huge um, approval rating amongst Democrats. I know this drives yes. me insane. Like he's got a 54% approval rating amongst De- this. Look, this is the latest time yeah. that people looked at it. Also, Republicans are always attacking Bezos. By the way, I can't stand Bezos, but like, he also is probably one of the most beloved corporate figures in America. People love yes. Amazon. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know why this is hard. For, like, look, I'm a guy online. I can say whatever I want, you know. But, you know. <laughs> wait, wait, sorry. Wait, here's, yeah. here's why you know it's hard. And Zach, I think this gets yeah. it. The contradictions of what you're actually trying to work out here. You are right that the way you articulated the Elon Musk thing. Yeah, Elon. And you could say it the way Republicans say it with Trump. Like, yeah, Elon will go a little too far sometimes. But man, like, he's awesome. I like yeah. electric cars. I like space. I like Mars, right? That's a, that is a good message. But to your point, that message would probably get destroyed on Twitter. Right. Could you, could you imagine, so imagine you're that Democratic politician, you tweeting out some version of that, especially when Elon just earlier this week said he may vote Republican in 2022 or 2024, your quote tweets and your mentions are going to be a disaster. So so this gets at the problem of the internet, yeah. which is that we're saying, oh, the internet is going to do this, this, and that. But like the internet, especially social media, creates incentive processes that are really hard to navigate. So how do you advise that Democrat that you just talked about thinking through yeah. this? I'm in... Um... I'm in more of the Liz Smith Democrat lane in terms of, uh, I don't know. How, Can you explain who she is? We haven't yeah, talked so about her So Liz Smith yet. was Pete Buttigieg's comms director. And I would, she's like middle, she's like an anti-establishment kind of like buck the trends, F you, um, moderate. She like worked for Cuomo, who was, I guess, uh, you know, less controversial when she was working for him. But um, it, like, what I mean is, let me phrase this even better. Eric Adams won the mayor's race. I love this race because it's so telling of where we are right now. It's, that guy had less Twitter followers than me. I do not have a large, like before he was running, like, <laughs> like on both accounts, his official account, his personal account, uh, by a lot. Like I think I doubled it and I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a big Twitter guy, right? Um, no social media. Whenever the, he hammered the press all day long. He's like, you're wrong. He doesn't, I mean, the guy literally didn't live in New York. He was like, he literally lived in New Jersey. They had like reporter, you can look this up, reporter filed him. He's been like investigated for corruption a ton of his entire career. Didn't matter. He just told people like, this is fake. That's not true. And this is what New York means. He was tough on crime. He was pro-family. He said the things that every Democrat wants to hear where they like, yeah, we're, we think like masks are maybe important, but we're not going to like ruin our kids over it. Right. Like there's like, there is nuance to some of these like moral high grounds of the Democrat, um, Democrats like to take. And Eric Adams did really well. So if I was, um, you know, if I was still doing the political advisory game, I would say Twitter's not real life. Um, you can't win a race on Twitter. Eric Adams proved that very well. Um, it, and I would go the mainstream Democrat or even some like moderate Republicans that are anti-Trump. And that, that lane is probably where the majority of Americans are. They're like, look, we're splitting hairs over these culture wars or God knows what. But the deficit's through the roof. The government, the, the country's not working. Crime is through the roof. People are fleeing. Our taxes are a disaster in certain parts of the country. Like, this is the stuff that hits home for people. This is what Democrats should be talking about. Instead, they're out with these, these moral lines where it's like, hey, we're pro-family, but let's keep the schools closed, right? Hey, we're pro-families, but let's let um, biological men compete against our biological females in sports. And it's, like, it's stuff that just doesn't make sense to some of the left. Um, and I, I think... Either they're afraid to talk about it or um, that's probably it. They're probably afraid Ooh. to get hammered on Twitter. Just, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have to, I have to push Zach on that one. You just, you know, biological men, women in sports, yeah, trans issues. I don't want to be on the, yeah, keep going. <laughs> don't want to be why, for. why should you talk about, so this is the difficult thing, right? So like you yeah. were just saying you should, so like, and this is where I'm just like, I'm basically playing like a, you know, a semi-cowardly democratic politician. 
what if I just don't take risks? What if I just yeah. don't say anything, right? It's, and that works for some, for a lot, actually, particularly if you're not pro, if you're like a blue district, like just don't piss anybody off. You're the main, like that sort of thing. Um, you try not to get outflanked from the left too often. Like Andrew talked about this, the duopoly is that you're incentivized to not get outflanked from the far left or the far right. Um, so the left where it's, I think we need some of the real leadership here because it's devoid of leadership and you're not getting it and people are really frustrated. And I think you can be pro trans rights and pro women at the same and pro little uh, young girls playing sports at the same time. And like, we are afraid to kind of navigate that. Now I'm not running for office. And I'd be, if I was, I would have a bunch of consultants in my ear being like, don't tell you this because the polling says that. And you have guys like Fetterman, they're like, screw the polls, F this, screw your consultants. I'm standing for this and we're going with it. And I argue that's the type of courage people are identifying with more so than the party line. Yeah, it's a lot like almost like a sister soldier type moment, 92. Uh, yeah, the left will hate Explain that, the reference, Sager. You're freaking lost, so sorry. Uh, I mean, back in 1992. Dude, we, love, we love losing. Come on, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, they, I they, say they, we like I'm a Democrat. I they do. I mean, go yeah. for it. I don't. Yeah, I have no beef. Honestly, I enjoy watching it happen. So yeah. anyway, uh, back in 1992, uh, what was it? Sister Soldier was a rapper, put out a song. Uh, was it calling for the death? I haven't looked into this in a long time. It was basically like. Did she say it was something about killing police officers? It was I NWA, but like a level right. beyond that. Yeah, it was something beyond fuck the police. Like it was okay. a, an extra level. Anyway, so she was repudiated by Bill Clinton at the time. And even though a lot of people had left politics, told him not to do it. They're like, you're going to piss off the Al Sharpton and the Jesse Jacksons. He does it, surges in the polls. It becomes known forever in history as the sister soldier moment in which his repudiation is what woos white working class voters who were previously had moved over and become Reagan Democrat or were known as Reagan Democrats back into the fold of the Democratic Party. So it's a kind of a longstanding uh, example for calling out fringe cultural elements in order to consolidate cultural ground while maintaining like economic centrism, something I obviously uh, am a, a proponent of. But what I want to kind of get to here, Zach, is as a concept in crypto uh, and in the Bitcoin community known as the flippening, which is like at a Bitcoin, at a certain Bitcoin price, I forget exactly what it is. I think it might be 100K, but at 100K Bitcoin price, which RIP the current price. More than 50% of the world's billionaires are then Bitcoin billionaires. And so that concept of the flippening is kind of seen as a reversal in the power dynamic. So obviously it's not here, but the potential for the flippening obviously does exist. We're 70K away right now from that. So it's far away, but not, you know, Bitcoin at one point was 65,000 yep. or something like that. I'm wondering what and if a flipping moment for the internet is possible. So it's like, everybody counts it out. Everybody counts it out. Everybody counts it out. Twitter doesn't matter. Eric Adams won, but one day it will matter. Like, look, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of millions of citizens who are on the internet. I talked about Rogan, Schultz. I mean, entire careers, including mine, are being made at the micro level on the internet at a certain point. And I do not know what that point is. It is going to matter more than the legacy. What mm -hmm. do you think... What do you think about that? First of all, do you think I'm yeah. right? Or, and what, what does that possibility look like? Having been at the very front forefront of this? Yep. So, um, it's a good question. I, look, we're, to your point, we're close in the sense that Yang's pod, like Yang Eyes podcast forward, you guys definitely breaking point. I mean, you guys are out, you have more people watching you than most shows on MSNBC, especially during yes. the day, right? No, you're probably no you're, question. Yeah. And you're probably pushing prime time, uh, yes. realistically, right? Yes. Joe Rogan is HBO Game of Thrones times 10 every time I touch a mic, at least before Spotify, right? Um, so that that part is happening right now. What what's left though is like ignore, like they're losing their influence in terms of persuading people and the number of people watching and listening and even taking action, but they still set the, like they being mainstream media and pundits and those types, they're still setting some of like the policy agenda or what they have still is legitimacy. Right. And we needed them to cover Andrew, not because we cared about their listeners, perhaps I mean, in some ways. Yes. But mainly the legitimacy, right. You're legit. Mm -hmm. If the times covers you, if yes. you guys cover them as awesome as you are, it's not the same form of legitimacy. Right. Um, and 
So when is the flipping? It's probably twofold, right? One where those type of legacy medias, it's really probably going to be tied to cable unplugging because that's where most of their money comes from, particularly mainstream media. These residuals from these cable deals that eventually uh, the users are going to be going to the different models of YouTube TV and types where it's um, it's not as, it's not as lucrative um, for the for the let's call it twenty four hour news channels, um, but the flipping to me is if we can get it, it may, it's registering to vote right so it's probably an aging thing because when you really register to, when you start to care when you're young as you, you get older and you frankly like have kids and buy a house or have some like sort of some form of community ties um, now if you're young you don't have kids you're good yeah you, you, like you care about politics but mainly from an identity standpoint not necessarily from a voting standpoint it doesn't touch your life as much as it does when you start paying more taxes you're sending your kid to public school or uh crime is an issue or whatever it is right like that stuff hurts you the older you get so i think the flipping is as these millennials and gen z's get older the other thing i am excited what andrew's working on it's so funny because he's normally like been like a front of the camera guy for like but a lot of stuff he's doing with the forward party is behind the scenes and it's mm -hmm. getting the primaries open like in the sense that you don't have you can be registered for any party and vote for a primary because right now most people are like, oh, I vote in November. And if they, um, once they learn that there is a primary and a candidate they like in the primary, they realize they're not registered or they have to wait another cycle. Um, so that I think will start to change the types of candidates you see. Um, but will there be a hard flipping? I don't know. Will we disintegrate before then? I don't know, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious your guys' thoughts. I'm not sure. I'm pretty, I think we're all kind of sure where how 2022 plays out. Uh, the economic environment for Dems is not great combined with their messaging, not looking good. But 2024, let's say Trump wins or loses a close one and how that, what happens? I don't know. I don't know, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think, I, I think you have a lot of unhappy people. Uh, I'm not sure what they, what they do. Something I'm curious about, and this has always been my like broad thesis on, the, on this space. I pushed Andrew on this a bit during our episode when he launched uh, the book the issue right now is it's easy for us to say all these like culture wars and like you have to choose between two sides, all these bits, yeah. but there are these very clear. And I think people on the left and the right try to push this aside, but like Supreme court actually is at, at stake. Like this isn't a fake DNC, you know, oh, gaslight talking yeah. point. Like this is, this is real. Um, and Roe v. Wade, you know, is, is likely going to be overturned. Th that is a real stake issue um, where there are just two sides of this issue. There's there's frankly two sides of the climate change issue. If you are a person who cares about climate change, there is one party who may disappoint you, but that party cares about and thinks the issue is real. Sagar, you and I spent a lot of time with Republicans. I could tell you, audience members, Republicans literally do not care about climate yeah. change. So. Yeah. At the same time, a lot of people who I know who care about climate change or care about abortion rights will say things like, I don't like the DNC. I kind of want something different. But they're kind of left out in a lurch. So how do things like the forward party, how do people like you, how do people like Andrew, how do new playbook candidates navigate trying to move into the fact that voters clearly want something different while there are still very clear polarizing stakes right. going on? I mean, you're looking at Andrew just was joking with me. He's like, we were saying, like, I feel like the Democrats owe half the country an apology for losing so many times because the majority of the country is not a huge majority, but it's almost 60 percent majority is pro. Um, they're pro choice, right? They're against, you know, um, you know, appeal it or repealing Roe v. Wade. And so you have a Supreme Court on a number of issues that's not reflecting the entire country. Um, and it's because the Dems keep losing um, and they're not. And, and that and combined with kind of a let's call it dysfunctional political system where Congress is not necessarily reflecting the will of the people either. Right. They can't codify the law as well. Um, once you, so I, I actually wanted to write this in books. So I talk about um, you know, the future of politics and what, what's what is the attention economy doing to our political world and what do you what can you expect? And you're starting to see these kind of identity branded politicians sprout up. I would say Bernie and Trump were kind of the first. 
Um, Bernie was Medicare for all. Trump was either make America great again or drain the swamp or basically F the system, right? Um, and Trump had his own kind of strong identity brand even before running. Um, but you then had AOC and the squad and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates, and you go down a list um, where folks are really, it, whether they pick an issue, they're not necessarily great at this, but they pick an issue and they make it part of who they are. And then they just lean into it all the time. And they're drawing people out because I stand for that. Right. Um, I didn't put this in the book, but I, it's my, uh, because my editor was like, this is somewhat ridiculous and it might be. Um, but I, my thought was, I feel like someone's going to have a strong identity brand of being, uh, frankly, a moderate. Um, and they'll be on the left or the right where they're like, like, and Yang was close to this where he was like math, like logic. Right. Um, and he had to do too much. I think um, in that race, we had to do too much that was outside the box. That was making people maybe like heads, especially traditional voters, uh, whether he was being funny or cursing or, or things like that, that made him a little uneasy. He was also new, but you'll start, I think you'll start to see, strong identity branded candidates with strong messages that are actually really moderate. Um, and they understand the attention economy so they can do the craziness and they have the hot takes. DeSantis is close, although he does some asshole stuff, but my parents live in Florida. I'm there pretty often. Like he's bumped minimum wage higher. He's done some good stuff on climate change. Teacher pay as well. Like, it's huge, yeah. yeah. So he does stuff that is most Democrats. So I have a lot of like moderate left friends in, in Jacksonville. My parents live like, they're like, we don't mind DeSantis. Like it's similar to the Trump thing. I don't like his rhetoric, but if you actually a couple layers deep in what he's done policy wise, um, a lot of stuff that the left likes. So um, I think that's kind of our future here. Um, it, I hope it t- touches on, I don't know if I have the full answer to your question. No, it does. It's, it's, on, a, it's yeah. a, once again, there's no answer to most of these questions because these are dynamics yeah. and a good politician could surf the dynamics and figure out an answer to it. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah. And it's, um, it doesn't uh, like the problem with the identity branding stuff is that you, you, it, you can't compromise. That is the biggest challenge. Um, you're not flexible. You can't compromise. Like Bernie Sanders running on Medicare for all. Theoretically, everybody who's voting for Medicare for all should be on board for Medicare for 80% too, because it compared to what we have would be substantial increase, but they're not it's a Medicare for all or nothing, or they lose their donor base. Um, so that's, that's where you end up where you kind of have, you have to fit the moment too, you know? Yeah. I think my last question really with you, Zach is what does the future look like? So if you are, and we get answers like this, all or questions like this all the time, especially now, 15 year old, 16 year old, they're like, I don't know if I even believe in politics anymore. What's the point of getting involved or I want to get involved, but it all just seems so terrible. So what can people take away who are like that from your book who can learn about what it actually takes and why it still probably fundamentally is a good endeavor to try and do something? I would say the, the what makes me excited is that the barriers to entry are lower than ever. Um, so a future prediction is that you're going, Andrew Yang is the beginning, not the end, right? Um, now he championed you know, his, his legacy will live on through a lot of his policy ideas. Um, but probably in the way that he competed in this economy. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more outsiders who took particularly, and Buttigieg is a good example there too, right? Where he's like, he was a little more establishment entrenched, but a mayor of a small town, right? Came out of nowhere and and had a chance to win the whole thing. One Iowa technically, right? Um, So I think you're going to see a lot more of those. Um, And I, my prediction would be the left, it may not be soon, but at some point they will figure out you're better off lining up behind a, an Andrew in the long run than you will be uh, with a with a Biden in a sense, um, mm-hmm. just like forcing it down. Now, uh, look, Trump is the wild card here, so that's I mean that's one of the reasons they everybody lined up behind Biden and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then for but for young people get into this, you know, I hope. If you're starting at a smaller like level, right, um, it's it's harder because it's a money game, right? And you're trying to get attention on you know a tiny race that by definition very few people are paying attention to. 
But if you do some of these tactics, you can find your lane, right? Like you can find, and that means like you can find a when you have a lane and you have an identity, like you can find money behind that, right? Um, Erica Rhodes in, in California, who I, I love, I don't know if she's, she's running against Brad Sherman in, um, in his district. I don't know, you know, I'm optimistic for her, but she's run. it's a tough race for her because he's a pretty relatively popular incumbent. Um, but she's found a lane both in, in crypto and teacher pay and things that, that he's not particularly like as strong on. And that's helped her raise money as well and stay relevant in, in a type of race. So it's that type of long shots um, that I'm optimistic for, not necessarily the first time they run, but their second, their third, where they can actually, uh, I think you can build your brand faster than now than you, you could in years past. And you can do it in a unique, authentic way. So we don't have the, we're not going to see a roster of plain manila politicians in the next 10 years. I think we're all going to see people with, uh, strong convictions and, and frankly, the entertainment value. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the game, right. Trump was great at this. It is entertainment, sadly. Um, and, and people will, will react to that accordingly. So in the last 10 minutes here, I'll just kind of go down the line of some questions I wrote down as, as you were, you were talking. So number one would be when you're looking at the national stage is holding prior elective office, a plus or a minus. I think this is increasingly, especially if you're an outsider candidate, going to be a minus. I think Andrew would not have been able to be as, let's say, like brand and like putting himself on the table successful if he'd been a House member. A governor would have been a little different, but I think a House member and almost certainly a senator probably wouldn't have helped him. Let's say if he were elected in 2010 or 2008. Yep. How do you think about that? It's... So, and the, the, the lame business school answer, like, it depends, um, but it probably does depend. So, I'll say this, like, by the, once Andrew got to, let's call it top, top 10, top, uh, I think he peaked at fifth in some of the poll, national polling, but um, once he got into that mix, it was pretty clear to us that if you put secretary, representative, senator, governor, any sort of elected office in front of his name, he would have bumped in the polls by a, a healthy amount um, mm -hmm. because that was the hesitation. Andrew like had top three in almost every positive polling metric you find, except he was the worst in, I can see him being president. Um, and which, which of course made sense, right? He'd never had any government office. Right. Um, and we didn't in the beginning, didn't like brand him accordingly in that sense. Right. We were trying to you know, fight and be relevant. Um, so in that, for in that case would have helped him. In other instances, I think it's awful, right? You're just the same old, same old. Um, so I, I think it depends, right? Like you've got, um, I'd say on the left, you've got folks like uh, like, a, like a Katie Porter or um, there's probably a good example where like they're, they're, they have the title, but they've been doing new and interesting things and talking about things in different ways um, that I think it's, it's wouldn't particularly hurt them. But yeah, at a certain level, like, Kamala, if we're not, if she runs, like, I don't think she would have won before being vice president, but now coming off this administration, I don't think that helps her either. Cause I think yeah. a lot of people want to change. Right. So, um, it goes back to how you're going to identify with said role. Like if you can come in and be like, yeah, I did that role. It was awful. And this is the way I go. Um, you know, I did the representative thing. I can't do anything. We have to be president, blow it all up. You could probably find an anti-establishment lane. Um, I like the executive roles better mayor, governor, cause it, um, you usually just get more talented people pursuing those because you're the, the actual, you know, the, you're the decider in that, in that job, as opposed to kind of the cog machine like you are when you're in the, the house, the Senate. So then the last question before we wrap, there's, there's a million questions. There's a lot of follow-up. This is why people should read the book. Cause this is I, I, what I like about you, what you did with the book and it says in the jacket is that this is like a, this is about like the ideas and like how you should think about these frameworks. You can apply them. Not everyone who's listening to this episode is going to run for office, but I was just asked with this question and I get so frustrated. What, what can social media do? And just to give a good example of this, I did a, I did an episode on AOC um, with uh, New York mag magazine. People who wrote a book about her and they were talking about, and I pushed them on this. I don't feel bad saying this, you know, AOC, she has this huge social media following and like she could communicate. My reaction was like, yeah, but who gives a shit? Like it, 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 like no matter how many followers on Instagram she gets, the green new deal will not actually ever pass 
because yeah. the metric of how many, so this goes to your point about Eric Adams. <laughs> it actually, it's not clear at all that unless you're Donald Trump and there are specific dynamics in the 2015 Republican primary that Twitter enables you to do, that dunking on Ted Cruz the way AOC does or going viral helps at all. Yes. So I'm super doomer on this. Like, this is an important, I think this is an important personal branding metric. This gets you magazine covers. I think this gets you a lot of attention, but I don't see attention to your point about the attention economy translating to electoral results. David Hogg could post as much as he wants. He's pretty good at social media with his base. It will not change one iota of gun control results nationally or even in the most local situations. So let's just close with this. How should we think about it? So I, I, I'm a big Stephen Covey fan. Um, he's got a quote and many of you used it. And it was, we, we like made it a mantra and I put it on the wall for our campaign. It's like, guys, the main thing is keep the main thing, the main thing. And I think a lot of people mm. miss that. And it's so, it's so stupid, but uh, look, the, the narrative AOC, AOC, look, what she did is remarkable. And, and, and sort of from a like high level standpoint, coming out of nowhere and, and winning that seat and becoming who she is. But also remember, so remember, like we uh, we were running right after she won, right? Yeah. Um, and folks were like, I remember telling me, you need a video like AOC. That's why she won. That she had this incredible video. Now, don't get me wrong, she had a really good campaign video, but it wasn't like millions and millions and millions of people saw it, right? It um, yeah. it did okay, and AOC blew up. Like she won that race because it had been an old white dude in a, a very non-old white district for a long time, and and that ran a bad campaign. Results, right? Yeah. And she and she ran a great campaign, right? She went door to door and did a thing, um, but that she blew up after that race, right? That video blew up after that race, where it was like, holy cow, who is this, right? Like that, no one sent anyone to cover her election night, right? Like you, to pretend that we were like all in on the AOC before she won is ridiculous, right? Um, so like she won because of her social media prowess is, is false. That's not true. Um, uh, she now has a, I mean, she was always good at it. Right. She now is, um, you know, is able to rile up pretty much anybody with, her, with one tweet. Right. Um, so for us, like on the campaign, it was, we were fighting, uh, legitimacy. Um, we were like, we had a good message. We were able to get pretty big crowds. Um, you know, not, not huge, but you know, hundred plus people, yeah, 300 people in Chicago and like, ooh, early fall 2018 that was bigger than most people in the field ever did now not your biggest front runners but you had 29 candidates in there that wasn't the issue the issue was well how do i know this guy's legit is he real i don't want to waste my vote and for us it was the debate stage how do you get on the debate stage and the dnc will give them credit they said if you have 65,000 individual donors uh you can come on the debate stage and so we're like, forget social media, forget the crowd rallies, forget that, like, if you like Andrew in any slight, any, every resource we have should be going to getting us on the debate stage and making us legit. And what was so honestly embarrassing for this country, in my opinion, was that half of the, the contenders in the field, probably more than half, did not even realize that. Yeah. And so uh, they're out there getting their endorsements or doing their MSNBC hits. And they hadn't qualified for the debate yet. And I mean, if you look at that list, if you remember, it was March of 2019, the, Ju- the debates in June, it was like Bernie, Biden, Warren, Kamala, the usual suspects, and Yang. And that was it. Um, and it was like, who the, like, because we were like, well, this was the target. Like, that's what we should be doing. Um, and so to answer that, now I get there to answer your question, social media is a tool. Use it for if it's going to help you, right? If it's going to help you raise money, it can. Can it help you raise awareness? Can it help you? get on reporters radars can help you get on voters radars yes 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 sure um are all voters on twitter no uh are all people you know are all uh, is your district on twitter like probably not right like so it's as long as it's a useful tool like we use it to generate news at times because we weren't getting real coverage we went we did a whole trip in south Mm -hmm. carolina uh we met with everybody big crowds the only thing that mattered was he did the cupid shuffle and then Chance the Rapper tweeted it. And here you go. Uh, we got a bunch of articles off that. So, you know, use it as a tool. Um, uh, and that's where like, people will use, keep the main thing. The main thing will do, do, do best, in my opinion. It's well said. Well, Zach, uh, we're going to have a link down in the description to the book. Really appreciate you joining us, man. And uh, I enjoyed this conversation. So thank you. I think it's really Likewise. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me on.
See you, dude. Yeah. Best of luck. Uh, it's book launch day when this is coming out, everyone. So uh, go to the bookshop, the book. support us, support Zach, support the show. Thanks, guys.